We are delighted to hear you all tonight. We really are. But we have to adhere to the timeline as uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of India will be arriving at 7.20 p.m. So please request all of you to bear with us. Thank you very much, Mr. Rice. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a corporate leader whose company makes things that we use every single day. And this company does it so successfully that we often forget about the company and only remember the brand. Mr. Andrew Whitty, CEO of GlaxoSmithKline, knows more than most about how to manage large numbers in a business. Appropriate, therefore, that he talks to us about accessing the next billion people for innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Mr. Whitty. Honourable Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you this evening. It's a very great pleasure to be once again here in Delhi. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, very much uh, similar to GE, as you just heard from John, has been in India for almost 100 years. And we're incredibly proud of our Indian heritage. In fact, in the 1960s and 70s, our Indian subsidiaries exported the first insights into how to market healthcare products from India to Europe, and has always been a great source of expertise and skill for the company. As you very kindly said in the introduction, we are used to dealing with big numbers in our business. Uh, after all, we're trying to deal with the healthcare needs of 7 billion people on the planet. Just to orientate you for a second to what GSK really is here in India, though, we have two businesses. We have a consumer healthcare business, which makes a brand called Horlix, which I suspect many of you in the room are familiar with. Uh, I'm often struck when I think about Horlix inside the company, because we measure Horlix in units of kilotons. Now, when you go to the store and spend five rupees for a sachet or a hundred rupees for a jar, um, I'm thinking about how many kilotons of that stuff you're consuming, and uh, we're incredibly proud of how Horlix has helped generations of Indians grow strong. We also have a very significant pharmaceutical business here and vaccine company. In fact, one-third, 30%, of everything that GSK makes globally is made here in India and sold to Indians. Only 1% of our global revenue for pharmaceuticals comes from India. And that represents in its own right one of the answers to the questions that I've been asked to talk to. How do we bring healthcare to the next billion people? The way to do that from our perspective at least is to think about how do we innovate, how do we bring the right types of medicines, and how do we make sure those medicines have access to those populations who may very well not have the spending power of the last billion, at least today, as they begin their journey on economic empowerment. We have to solve that problem, and in India we've solved that problem at GSK. That's why we're able to supply fully one-third of our volume to a population at just 1% of our revenue. To do that, we're a very substantial investor in this country, and we're right in the middle of building a brand new, one of the first greenfield pharmaceutical facilities uh, just outside of Bangalore, Vemgal. This is going to be an absolute state-of-the-art facility, probably the largest pharmaceutical factory in the world, and it will manufacture some of the largest quantities of the most modern medicines using cutting-edge technology in the world. So there's a lot that we're trying to do to help. What really is the challenge of how can we get healthcare to this next billion. The very first thing we should be doing, and this really, I guess, is a request to policymakers and a request to all CEOs in the audience, not just those from the healthcare industry, it has nothing to do with the drugs business, it has nothing to do with the vaccine business, it has everything to do with the food industry, exercise, education, and how we live our lives. Healthcare and the notion of how we deal with healthcare challenge is rooted in a concept of failure, that somehow we've not looked after ourselves quite as well as we should have done. And a lesson from the West, as we've done a fantastic job of extending life from a life expectancy of 40 years in 1910 to a life expectancy of around 80 years today, what we haven't done enough of is work hard on the quality of life as those years have been accrued. That the burden of illness which has accompanied the extension of years 
has meant an extraordinary cost. So the very first thing as policymakers we need to work hard on is to how do we build quality into those lives? How do we exercise better? How do we eat better? How do we get more people to have the right balance in their lives? All of those things which are all about prevention. Secondly, to extend prevention into a more interventionist way, vaccination is probably the single biggest cause of the extension of life years over the last 100 years. The elimination in many parts of the world of, mater of childhood death from commonly preventable diseases is probably the single biggest driver of life expectancy growth over the last century. Prime Minister Modi and the government have made some very significant commitments to extending vaccination schedules here in India, particularly in three particularly difficult disease areas. The opportunity to make a huge impact for the country and for the next generations of Indians is right there and a fantastic commitment from the government to true prevention. That then leaves you with, okay, we've tried to prevent illness through the way we live. We try to prevent illness through the way that we protect in vaccination. But inevitably, of course, we're going to get ill. You can be a saint. You can live like a saint. But eventually, something is going to happen to us all. In the UK, there's an estimate by the time we're 60, you have a one in three chance of being disabled in some form or another. And so as we get older and older, it's inevitable that we are going to engage ourselves with the healthcare system. And I simply make a couple of observations and maybe building on some of the insights and observations of both Dominic and John before me. Healthcare is not unique. It's not isolated from the very same trends that you've heard in industrial fields and in all of the industries that Dominique talked about. Digitization is a reality, miniaturization. A friend of mine recently had his hip replaced under local anesthetic. Possibility of that is almost, would have been unimaginable 10 or 15 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. The idea that you might fly 5,000 miles to have that surgery done and then fly home again, extraordinary. So the changes in healthcare are many and very similar to some of the things you've heard. The opportunity for India in this regard, I think, is extraordinary to demonstrate true innovation. So one of the great human characteristics is our ability to learn. One of our less good characteristics is our ability to try and force other people to do what we did as some kind of expression of power. India has the extraordinary opportunity to reflect on a hundred years of healthcare revolution in America, Europe, and other parts of the world. My suspicion is there are relatively few policymakers in 2016 who today feel that their healthcare infrastructure and process is fit for purpose. I think many of them feel that they're stuck with too much fixed infrastructure. They have a system which is orientated around too many big hospitals. Those hospitals, by definition, can't move with the population. By definition, they tend to be built around the process mindset on the day they were built. And when new technologies come along, you find those technologies are redundant. You find health systems which are spending too much money on big fixed capital equipment, which within two or three years has been miniaturized and turned portable. All of those issues are characteristic of a Western healthcare system. The opportunity for India is to really imagine what the modern, truly modern, not simply a more efficient version of what we have, but what is a truly modern healthcare system? And how do you get from where you are today to that? How do you release the energy in the system to allow that to happen? And I would simply make a few observations. There is great opportunity to rethink how to really streamline, speed up, and accelerate the regulatory process. How we manage to quality. Let's really focus on what the outcome we're looking for and create the modern regulatory process to get there. There's some tremendous first steps being made in that direction in the last 18, 24 months in this country. It's a great opportunity. How to seize the, the advantage of miniaturization, digitization, the ability to take health care to the people, not require people to come to the temples of hospitals. Those sorts of mindset shifts. Our ability to really think through how we can have minimal touch with people with maximum quality output. 
2016 is a leap year, and it seems to me that it would be a very appropriate year to set all of us a challenge in India to think about not how we catch up, not how we improve, but how we leap over what has been learned in the rest of the world, how we truly set a new standard, which others can then strive to emulate across the world. As I finish my comments, and I've talked almost entirely about India, within India, I would like to suggest a slightly different lens. India also has a great obligation as a rising superpower of the world to influence the world. And I think there are two, and there are many others, but there are two I'd like to touch on topics where I believe India's intervention in the next few years can be absolutely pivotal, not just for the people of India, but for global populations. The first takes me back to the very first comments I talked about in terms of extension of life expectancy and how some of that has been achieved. There is a cloud on the horizon which could, in the worst scenarios, start to change that direction of travel. And it's called antimicrobial resistance the potential for bacterial disease which has been brought, broadly brought under control in the last 60 years to go out of control. I was very encouraged to hear Prime Minister Modi's interest and commitment to this in his recent visit to London, and I really hope that India and the Indian government will take a leadership role with other countries around the world to work towards an effective strategy to manage antimicrobial resistance. This is not a domestic threat, it's a global threat which will have domestic impact in every country in the world and the world needs to get ahead of this before it's a crisis. The second area is potentially the most controversial thing I'm going to say this afternoon. For many years India, for good or bad, correctly or incorrectly, has been associated with comments about India's commitment to intellectual property. And my industry has often been at the center of those debates. India has such a phenomenal chance now to set a completely new direction for the world. The whole world is trying to solve a problem of how do we encourage innovation and yet how do we deliver that innovation to billions of people around the world. If there is a people on the planet who can solve that problem, surely it's the Indian population a home of innovation and invention, which surely we want to protect and encourage. We want to see those families come forward and make those discoveries to not only bring income into their family, but to increase the wealth of their community. But of course, we want that innovation to be made available to everybody who needs it. I would really ask India to think through how you can help the rest of the world strike that balance, not choice, but balance between innovation and access. And to repeat the statistic I gave you earlier, our belief at GSK is that we've begun to achieve that balance as a result of which one third of everything we make in the world is made available to Indian consumers who only pay 1% of the revenue of the company. That is a clear exam example of an ability to make the model work. I hope very much that as India absolutely occupies its rightful leadership positions, it will elect to take some of these healthcare issues like AMR, like the balance between innovation and access, onto its already broad agenda because it can make a difference not just for the people of India, but for everybody in the world. My thanks to the Economics Times for this invitation. It's been a very great pleasure to address you, and I thank you for your attention.